Thank you so much, Debbie, for that great message of the day when we will uh, behold the face of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Thank you so much. Today I want to talk to you about the blessing of ascension, and I invite us to hear these words today from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. <clears throat> then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my Father has promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Acrophobia. The extreme fear of heights. Maybe you know somebody who has a fear of heights. Maybe you have it. I know that I have a real fear of heights. It, it might not be to the point of acrophobia, but it's getting pretty close. Tall bridges make me break out in a cold sweat. Big roller coasters with that big lift hill going up into the sky. No, thank you. Not for me. Skyscrapers that have that observation deck at the top where you can go up there and see all the world going out there. I don't want to see it. I'm good on the ground. What about airplanes? Nope. Not for me either. In fact, I get a little queasy just riding into Atlanta and seeing all the planes come in and take off. I, I, th I think the only way I would fly is if Captain Sully was my pilot. I think I might do that. Captain Sully, you remember the Miracle on the Hudson pilot? I think I might take him. I might, I might fly there. Hopefully you're better at heights than I am. If you don't like heights, come tell me after church and we can form us a club. We'll have a great time on the ground. Our scripture passage says this. It says, while Jesus was blessing them, he, was, he left them and was taken up into heaven. I picture Jesus rising into the sky, into the clouds, no more to be seen. And I realized that he must not have had a fear of heights like I do. I mean, I think about it. What if that would have happened to me? I would freak out. If I started rising up into the air out of no control of my own, I would start flapping my wings, trying to get back down. i got to get back down on the ground. But while I might not like it very much, what we hear today about Jesus is actually something really special. This is called the ascension. Jesus ascending from earth into heaven after the resurrection. Now, your first, your first thought may be, you know what, I don't know if I can believe this part of the story. Well, let me tell you, I, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the miracles of Jesus. I believe in the resurrection. So I'm not going to let something like the ascension stop me from believing in what God can do. You might say, well, I've never seen anybody else do this before. And that's exactly the point, y'all. No one else has done it before. No one else is Jesus. So I want to talk about the blessing of ascension this morning and what it means for our lives today. First of all, the ascension proves that Jesus is exactly who the Scriptures say that he is. One of the most important things for us to do is to get right who Jesus is. That's one thing we can't leave up for debate, because if we get wrong who Jesus is, we get everything else wrong too. The Old Testament had promised a coming king, a coming Messiah sent from God. And the New Testament proclaims that this king has shown up and that it is Jesus himself. You might remember Luke's telling of this arrival in his famous Christmas story passage. There were in that same country shepherds 
abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Well, this same Jesus, who was announced by the angels, is the same one who lived a perfect life. He showed us the love of God. He died on the cross. He was raised on the third day. And after that happened, he ascends into heaven. The ascension is the final confirmation that Jesus is who the scriptures say he is. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is God's King. And by what he accomplished on the cross for us, he brings about our salvation. And and get this, y'all. If Jesus is who he says he is, and the scriptures say that he is, everything changes, right? The whole world is now different because of him. And we have to get right who Jesus is so that we can take part in the salvation that he came to bring. Luke says that the result of all of this is so that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed to all nations. Repentance is what we have to do. That's on our end. We confess our sin. We acknowledge our wrongdoing. But then forgiveness is what Jesus does for us. He forgives us of our sin. He cleanses us and makes us whole. And this brings about our new birth so that we can live a new life in Jesus Christ. But we've got to get Jesus right first. I remember taking a Latin class in college, and it did not go well. I remember the first day the teacher came in telling us that she was going to be teaching by using all of the English grammar categories and then applying them to Latin. And what she assumed is that I already had those building blocks down. And she was so wrong about that. Uh, I knew my my nouns and verbs, but I couldn't keep straight the the pronouns, the adjectives, the adverbs, the prepositions, the conjunctions, the interjections, all of that stuff. I didn't have the building blocks even for English. It was hard to, to build anything else on that foundation. And get this, my grade reflected it. The ascension helps us to get right who Jesus is. It helps us to get the building blocks right, and then we can go from there. He is everything the scriptures say that he is. He's the Messiah, the Savior. He's the King. And now it's up to us to to build our lives upon that solid foundation. Secondly, the ascension means that Jesus reigns over all of creation as our King. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Philippians 2. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This means that Jesus is above everything. Nothing and no one is higher than Jesus. He is the Lord. Well, what does that mean for us today? What does it mean to to live as if Jesus reigns over everything right now? Well, it doesn't mean anything good if Jesus were a cruel king. Or if Jesus were a mean king. It wouldn't mean anything good if Jesus were a spiteful king. I mean, if Jesus were in charge and, and he was any of those things, it wouldn't be good for us. But the good news is that we know he is not the cruel, mean, spiteful king. The good news is that Jesus is a good king, a loving king, a generous king, a trustworthy king. And he rules over all creation and he's looking out for our best interests. He's leading us in the right direction. He's leading us towards God's best if we will listen to him, if we will listen follow him. Pastor Will Willimon tells the story of a friend of his 
who at midlife decided that he wanted to learn how to fly. And Willimon remembers him saying that, that he felt growing anxiety as, as he contemplated that day when he would have to wave goodbye to his flight instructor and take the plane up all by himself. He says when that day came, his friend said this, My instructor had taught me so consistently, so repeatedly, so assuredly that I just knew everything I had to do. And I could almost hear his voice as if he were right there in the cockpit with me. Y'all, as Jesus reigns over all creation today, did you know that he doesn't leave us alone in the cockpit all by ourselves? As we spend more time with him, as we learn and grow from him, we become who he wants us to be, and, and we learn how to recognize his voice in our daily lives as if he were right there with us. You know, that doesn't sound like most kings that you see in TV and movies. Typically, kings are like out for themselves. They're only looking out for their best interest. They're only doing what's best for them. But Jesus isn't like that. Jesus is the humble king, the gentle king. He is the true king. Back in the ancient Roman world, it was expected of the Roman people to bow down their knees to Emperor Caesar. But when Jesus came along, especially after the resurrection and the ascension, the people of God know that that's no longer an option. They knew that they could not bow down their knee to the emperor and to Jesus because only Jesus was Lord. And did you know that we face the same kind of dilemma today? There are many other things and other people who are vying for our attention and our devotion and our worship. And they call out to us all the time. They say, hey, over here, this is important. You need to live for this. You need to give your money to this. Get riled up about this cause over here. Y'all, as Christians, we bow our knees to Jesus. Don't give that worship to anybody else or anything else. Because there's only one Savior who lived for you, who died for you, who was raised for you. And he deserves he deserves our everything. Finally, we learn that Jesus gives power for this life to his followers. He promises the disciples here, Behold, I send the promise of my Father, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And if you read a couple of chapters into the book of Acts, you know that that promise comes true. The Father promised the gift, Jesus gave the gift, and they were clothed with that power from on high as they received the Holy Spirit. And to show you what kind of a difference that Holy Spirit power can make in our lives today, I want us to think about the Apostle Peter. Think about the story. After the crucifixion, Peter and the other disciples, they were hiding behind locked doors, living in fear, they were scared. They lacked no power for this earthly life. But after the resurrection, after the ascension, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the believers and Peter becomes this bold, courageous preacher of the gospel. Peter quickly stands up to preach to this large group in Jerusalem. And there's only one explanation of how that was able to happen. Power from on high. Peter preaches to the group. He says, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out that which you see and hear this day. He's poured out the Holy Spirit. Well, here's a question for you. What could turn that, that Jesus denier, Peter, what could turn that scared disciple into such a bold proclaimer of the good news? The Holy Spirit. Peter was clothed with power from on high, and he wasn't alone. The rest of the disciples followed in that same way, as they experienced the same thing. 
I remember when I was young and the movie Aladdin came out. Y'all remember the movie Aladdin? They've, uh, they released a remake a few years ago. It was okay, but not quite as good as the original Aladdin. And uh, I remember that Aladdin finds the, the magic lamp and the blue genie comes out of the lamp, played by Robin Williams. And in typical Robin Williams fashion, the genie was going like 100 miles an hour all the time. He was speaking like 10,000 words a minute. It was so funny as he was doing it. And you'll remember in the story that the genie grants Aladdin three wishes. I thought about that. What would I do with three wishes? What would you do with three wishes from a magic genie? Well, I think we'd all probably land something near the same things, right? Money, health, power, influence, success, something like that. Well, luckily, God does not always grant us the desires of our heart because he's not a genie. Because that stuff isn't always good for us anyway. No, instead, we receive something so much better. We are gifted, we are clothed with power from on high, and we don't even have to find a magic lamp to get there. And we don't just receive power for power's sake. Jesus tells the disciples here, you are my witnesses. Did you know that God is calling you to be a witness? What a high and holy calling that is. And did you know that that he would not call us to that if he didn't believe that we could do it? The Holy Spirit comes into our lives to change us, to make us holy, to turn us into God's people for the world. And the ascension makes all of that possible for us. In John's gospel, Jesus says, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit gives us power in this life, to live for God and to become the people that we were meant to be. Now, church, here's the thing. I can't exactly explain the ascension. I've never seen an ascension. I've never been part of one before. But again, that's because no one else is the risen Son of God, Lord Jesus Christ. But even though I can't explain the ascension, I know what it means. For me, for us, and for our lives. And it means everything. The version of the story in the book of Acts says that the disciples were looking up and they saw Jesus no more, but then suddenly two angels were with them. It says, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go. Do I think Jesus went up into the sky? Yes, absolutely I do. I don't think it's like when I was a kid and I would let go of my balloon. Y'all ever do this? When you were a kid, you let go of your balloon. It was usually by an accident by me, and I would start crying as soon as my balloon went off into the sky. But it was so cool because you could watch it for as long as humanly possible in the sky, but it would always get to that point where my eye was not strong enough to see it. It wasn't exactly like that with Jesus. Jesus didn't just disappear from our physical eyesight because he went too high. No, he also entered the heavenly realm. And while we may not be able to see that with our own eyes, it doesn't mean he's far away. He's close. He's nearby. And he's alive. And he loves us very much. It's almost as if he were right here in the cockpit with us. Like the disciples, we know we can't keep gazing up into the sky Because we know there's work to be done, right? The mission continues. We are filled with the gift that Jesus promises. The gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Hawkinsville first. You have been clothed with power from on high. Imagine that. Us? Yeah, us. Power here and now. Power so that we can go to be faithful witnesses to a world that desperately needs to see and know the love of God. We get to be a part of that. How amazing. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the ascension, that Jesus rises into heaven and he now reigns as king over all, and that he sends us the Holy Spirit. Father, we know that we have now been clothed with power from on high. We're, we're clothed with power this day. We're filled up so that we can be sent out to be your people. Lord, help us to be witnesses to the good news of Jesus Christ. In a world that's filled with evil and darkness and despair, help us to go and be a voice of hope and love and peace and mercy. Not by our own strength, not on our own power, but all because of that Holy Spirit power that lives and dwells inside each of us. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.